This is Scott Richman. And Arnie Sherman. You're listening to What Do You Know on News Talk KGVO, AM 1290 and 98.3 FM. For our listeners, today on the show we're going to have the new University of Montana 38-year-old president, Seth Bodner, as our guest. Can't wait. And as I was thinking about the show today, I was ruminating, now that we're talking to a college you know, president, I have to use bigger words. I was ruminating on the fact of how important education is to our community, to our country, to the world. I mean, one of the reasons I live in Missoula, Montana, is I don't like to be around dumb, uneducated people. I, I agree. There's plenty of places in the United <laughs> States where you can go and do that. Not Missoula. No, not Missoula. And it's important to our community. You know, it's a university town. I've lived in several other university towns. I lived in Oxford, Ohio, where Miami of Ohio is, and the town rises and falls on the on the well-being of the university. Yep, I see that. I lived in Cincinnati, Ohio, which has got other things going on, but I went to both universities there, University of Cincinnati and Xavier, which ironically or interestingly are only three miles apart. Right, so right, right. you can consider the core of the downtown of Cincinnati, a university town, right. because there's almost 50,000 students at those two universities, you know, literally, you know, a stone's throw from the downtown of the community. And I started thinking about how important having an education is to just you and me. I was the first person in my family to graduate college. Were you really? Yeah, I was the first person to graduate college, and my parents instilled in me, you know, the drive to, you know, go to school you know, go on and go to graduate school and, and have a professional so career. So you have both a, you have both an undergraduate degree and a graduate well, I degree. Do, I have both from of where? Those. From undergraduate from the University of Cincinnati and a graduate degree from Xavier University. Xavier, right. Okay, you said that. Sorry. And, I see. But I, I, have realized, <laughs> I realized that, you know, we are facing in Missoula a challenge, which is not uh, unusual. We have a declining enrollment. In fact, uh, um, 58% of the universities in the United States have a declining enrollment. Sure. And that has to do with falling birth rates primarily. Last year, only 84,000 less high school graduates than the year before. Less students. For, uh, Is that right? Yeah. In fact, in fact, some of the major universities in the United States have had, in the last couple of years, a significant enrollment application downturn. And I'm talking about... Stanford, Michigan, Princeton, um, MIT, Cooper Union, Amherst all have declining applications. So it's just fewer applications to the schools. But then how about online colleges and those types of, is it, does it, is it inclusive of that? You know, when we used to think education was, you know, and we still do, so important. Brick and mortar. Only 40% of Americans have college degrees. From right. Four, and, and that ranks us 19th. There are 18 countries in the world that have higher uh, graduation rates from college than us, including Russia has a higher graduation rate than the United States, 55% compared to 40% here. Ireland, New Zealand, Belgium, there are many countries in the world that have higher educational uh, you know, attainment rates than right. we do here. And, and that's, a, you know, that's an important issue. Bring it more down to Missoula. You know, we've, we've lost four or 5,000 students over the last five years. We're down to, what, about 11,865 uh, full-time students. Here at, at U of M. At U but, of M. But, Arnie, yep. MSU, their enrollment is up. Their enrollment's up. They had 16,703. So they're that much ahead of us? Yeah, at one point, five, six, seven years ago, we were about equal. You're kidding. No, it has to do with many, many factors. What are they? Well, I think one of the biggest factors is that that well, the, the folks we're seeing in college now made decisions two, three years ago to be here. Right, sure. And they're, they're the ag and engineering school, and there was a, a huge boom in the Bakken oil field at that time, which attracted a lot of people right, to go right. to a te- an engineering, architectural design, you know, where the jobs were, you know, flowing. Right. There's been a downturn in that, although oil is back over seventy dollars a barrel. And what's our and our big is our big kind of curriculum or, or area of expertise is liberal arts. Well, we forestry. also have the new two year college, the Missoula College, which right. has technical technical <clears throat> training and, and education. But I think there is an overall belief in, in uh, that 
educational attainment is not as important as it used to be. I mean, even the current administration, there was a poll I just read that right. Republicans don't think college education is as valuable as it used to be, by and large. I, in fact, have to say that I, somebody asked me the other day about going on to graduate school, and for the first time ever, I told someone I didn't think they should. Right. Normally, I say, go on to graduate school and get, but in this particular case, because of the area that this person was uh, wanted to work in, right. I thought it was more important at this juncture to for them to go and get uh, work experience and to you know work in the field rather than just go on we, to graduate school. So we're going to have a lively uh, conversation with doctor, doctor, right? Doctor Seth. No, he's not a doctor. Oh, he's not a doctor. But he is a major. He's a major. You know, he graduated first in his class. The only from, thing he doesn't have is a PhD. <laughs> well, he has two master's degrees. Wow. From uh, from uh, Oxford, he graduated first in his class from West Point. You know, and that's a very tough thing to do, particularly you know uh, in this era. Um, he uh, he is a Truman and uh, Rhodes Scholar. scholar. You know he's a, he's a, he was a uh, a ranger in Green Beret. I mean he has a, he has a very exciting Impressive. background, which we'll talk about. Well, I thought my resume was good. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. Yeah, you were you were a ranger on Uncle Bob's you know TV show. You you applied for the ranger I program. Love radio, but but uh, but I but I want to talk. You know, we, he has a ten million dollar shortfall that he's facing over the next four right, years. Real at challenges the university. here. There are many many challenges. He worked at GE Transportation, where he was considered uh, um, a trans, a chen, you know, no, <laughs> not no, trans, no, 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 transformational. No, no, no. He was considered a transformational leader at GE Transportation, right? And uh, he's now on the job for a month, trying to, uh, I think, figure out how to move the university in the direction it needs to go. Can't wait, Arnie. All right, when we come back, we're going to be meeting with President of the University of Montana, Seth Bodner. Back after this. The, what's nice about this is it's a conversation. Yeah. But anyway, for, nobody is. I, you know, I, I had a high school coach that uh, one of the things he used to say, and I forget who he quoted it from, but uh, you're never as good as you think you are. And you're never as bad as you think you are. <laughs> and you played what? Baseball? I played, well, I played in high school. I played basketball, baseball, a little football. Uh, and then in college, I played baseball. And who's your team? You know, I grew up north of, uh, about an hour north of Pittsburgh, so I like the Pirates. That's unfortunate. Although I have, I got to admit, I do have a little bit of an affinity. Uh, I, I, I don't mind the Yankees. That's uh, good, because we're both Yankee fans. Because, uh, you know, we did our, it, it, so I played, I played baseball at West Point. Right. As, um, the Yankees and, and George Steinbrenner used to sponsor, in part, our spring trip. So we would go down and play. Uh, in the spring and in Tampa at the right. Yankees spring training facility, which mm. was uh, which was quite an experience. Too. Reggie Jackson was at our practice uh, one of the days. Just such a such a special experience and such a you know generous gesture on behalf of the Yankees organization. So I appreciate him. In fact, 100%. I remember that they used to play some uh, exhibition games with with. They did, Army. yeah. In fact, they they restarted that tradition um, just a few a few years ago. Yeah, they had the Yankees. Uh, do an exhibition game against against West Point, but they used to do it every year. You know, it, it's kind of fun because the field is still in the same spot at sure. West Point as it's been, and so you stand in the batter's box. You're like Babe Ruth actually played right here. So, so where'd you grow up? So I grew up in uh, Western Pennsylvania. Uh, like I said, about halfway between Pittsburgh and Erie, so small town, uh, Western Pennsylvania. My parents were both elementary educators. My mom taught uh, kindergarten and first and second grade, and my dad was a fifth grade teacher and then became a principal and then uh, toward the end of his career was the superintendent of a small rural school district. So how did you get the lure to go to West Point as opposed to like Penn State, for example? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I didn't, have, I didn't come from a military background. Uh, my grandfather was in World War II, um, but no experience with the military at all, actually. But I was getting to my senior year, and I was looking at places. I was looking playing baseball. I was looking at places like Princeton or Dartmouth and, uh, and a few other schools. And it came down to a decision, you know, in, in part financial. You know, my parents said, hey, I never, I never lacked for anything. You know, I had a great, uh, great childhood, but I didn't have, much, I didn't have a college fund. And uh, so as we were looking at the costs of some of these other places, that was pretty steep. And then West Point, the idea of this 
whole of person education. You know, mm-hmm. that, that you're going to get a great uh, academic education and you're going to get the character development, the leadership development. That was intriguing to me in the history of the place. Uh, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Uh, but I said, I'll give it a try. And uh, if I don't like it, I can leave after a couple of years. So then you become first in your class by the time you graduate. How did that happen? You know... <laughs> They don't take bribes there. I know. Right, yeah. I, I've they heard that. They don't take bribes. I, you uh, earn that. You know, I uh, I had a class that wasn't very smart. No, <laughs> no, I had many, no, many, many smart. people in my class much smarter than I am. I uh, No, I was very fortunate. I had a bunch of great instructors. I had a bunch of great mentors at West Point. You know, I, I went to West Point as a as a kid who'd been on an airplane once in his life. You know, when we went on vacation. Is that right? Yeah, one time. Uh and, uh, you know, we used to go on vacation. We'd drive to Florida. I, you know, I'd still tease my parents today. Right. You know, I had an aunt in Houston and, who had moved to, to Houston and from Pittsburgh. And I uh, said, so, oh, we got to go visit. we got to go visit Aunt Peggy and Uncle Steve. Eight of us piled into a, an, an Oldsmobile. And, uh, station the, wagon. Not even a station wagon. I sat oh, on the really? floor on between my mom's feet for, from the trip from Pittsburgh to Houston. Uh, so it was a, uh, you know, like I said, a great childhood. But, um, but West Point really opened opportunities for Were me. Were there any memorable fellow students or mentors that you had there that, you know, you want to share with us? You know, I think uh, it was people in, in what's called the Department of Social Sciences, uh, uh, referred to as SOCH. I mean, the Department of Social Sciences is a, uh, it's where we have our economics, our political science, uh, those, those types of disciplines. Sure. And uh, in Lincoln Hall and, and the, the group of professors that were there, um, you know, it was a place where a lot of Army leaders, uh, as you know, they do, they do a, a, a visiting time where they come and teach for a couple of years and go back into the, out into the force. So everyone from Wes Clark to, to General Petraeus to, uh, you know, I could name, you know, General Abizade, like I could name lists of the generals that have, when they were captains and majors, taught at West Point. And that, that uh, department, I would say, shaped, you know, the mm-hmm. trajectory of my life in a very big way. You didn't mention my favorite West Point graduate, who also was a Rhodes Scholar, Chris Christofferson. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he went on to a, a, a military career, and then he left and went into country music. Me and Bobby McGee? Yeah, you, me and Bobby McGee, Chris, Chris <laughs> Christofferson. So, you know, I, that might be what happens next. <laughs> you do Montana. play the guitar, don't you? I wish I played the guitar. I, you know, I, 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 am, I do uh, singing performances uh, nightly. Oh, good. For my kids. Oh, yeah. That's good. That's uh, how old are your children? <laughs> I have uh, seven-year-old twins and a, and a four-year-old. But uh, That's so great. So, I so, get them so we mentioned in the lead-in a little bit about yeah. your background. You know, you went to West Point. You got a Truman and a Rhodes Scholar mm-hmm. ship. You went on to Oxford and got two master's degrees. And then you mm-hmm. launched into a military career that lasted, what, almost 10 years? Right. So why did you get out? What, 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 what was there? A, was there a, a seminal event that happened that that ha- made you yeah. part ways? You know, no, actually, I loved my time in the military. Like I said, people, people, you know, when you're in the military, and it's great. People say, "Hey, thank you for your service," and I, I deeply appreciate that. But I, I always feel a little bit bad when people say that because, boy, the military was great to me. You know, yeah, it was tough. It mm-hmm. wasn't easy. It was scary at times, but it. It opened doors and opportunities for me that I never would have had. I mean, you, you I jumped had, out. You jumped out of airplanes, right? I, I mean, did, you were a yeah. Green Beret yeah. and a Ranger. Yeah. You got what certified in, in scuba combat. We yeah, we I did do all those things. I, uh, <laughs> so it was it was a great experience. I uh, but I I got to the point where I I'd been in over ten years. I had a couple of young kids. I was in my in my thirties, and I thought, all right, this has been great been a great part of my life but do I want it to be my entire career you were a major at that time. I was I was a major um, had been promoted early to major was was, was going really well and, and was really enjoying it and uh, but I, I you know you came to that decision point in your life you said all right is this gonna be a great part of my life or my entire life and I said you know I, I want to see and do some other things I hadn't frankly expected to stay in the army quite as long as I did but I, I was having good experience and felt compelled to serve but I but I, I wanted to go and and do some other things well, it takes a lot of discipline to be on a fast track in something like the military and then yeah. make the decision to move on 
So yeah. how did the GE thing come up? G transportation. How yeah. did that fit in? So you know, when I was uh, and I was deciding to get out, I actually was thinking about two different paths. You know, there was uh, a path where I, cause I was I was a professor at West Point at the time, assistant professor of economics, and. Uh, you know, there was an option to finish up graduate work, get my PhD, and just be a permanent professor. And I thought, you know, I, I love teaching. I love being in higher ed. But but I want to go and I want to see how the uh, the private sector works. Sure. I want to understand how to lead a large organization. And I thought, okay, GE seems to teach people to do that pretty well. So I I, I took a leap and I went and uh, and worked you know, worked my way up, you know, and, and I think what, what you find in organizations like that is, you know, you, you, you obviously got to get opportunities, but then you got to make the most of them. And I had a, a few opportunities and, uh, you know, you get, you get noticed and they, uh, give you a couple up of, uh, they say, do you, Hey, would you be interested in doing this role? And, and you, you say yes, even sure. if you don't really know what the role entails. When you were GE, was there still a, a flavor of the Jack Welch management style there or that, that dissipated by that time? You know, I think it's, yeah, I think, sure, right? There's, uh, you know, every organization evolves over time, but I think what you, you find, what I found there is it's, uh, it was an organization that said, all right, let's be clear about what you're going to do. Uh, let's systematically look at how you're going to get it done, and then let, we'll hold you accountable for whether you did right. it or not. I remember that one of the Welsh um, strategies was to evaluate the uh, the lowest ten uh, percent of the management, uh, right, and f- get rid of them every year. Mm-hmm. Is that something that <laughs> that you've adopted, or is that something that you've uh, learned maybe doesn't work so well? No, I mean I think I think you you've. What I would say is it's really important for any organization. To have effective uh, performance and, and professional development systems in place, right? I don't. I'm not saying yeah, you need to cut 10 percent of the right. every year, but but what I would tell you is I think it's really important that uh, managers and and their and their employees and, and just teams say, all right, here's here's what my role is, and this is my expectations for this role. These are my ex- these are yours. Here's what success looks like, and then we're gonna hold each other mutually accountable to get in there and I think that you know that's something they do uh, they do fairly well in places like G not perfectly um, and that's not about punitive cuts that's about setting clear expectations and, and making sure you can effectively work together. And communicating with and communicating other. exactly well in your mind you work for G transportation and they produce products yep. among other things in fact my friend who ran National Transportation Safety Board said that the G turbofan engine was probably one of the most you know, uh, transforming products yeah. that have ever you know been devised. Right. I don't know if you know this. This engine is almost perfect, and you know, you can run a plane for seventeen hours on right. two of these things. Right. You know, and yeah. when you were there, were there other products like that in development that, that were you know that were going to be transformative yeah. in the future? Yeah, you know, I think um, so. Our, our aviation business that you're talking about right. is, is is it's a it's a fascinating business. I mean, you think three hundred thousand people. Above the Earth right now on on aircraft powered by, powered by GE engines, um, but I think it's it's a you know whether it's in wind turbines uh, I mean locomotives building fuel efficient locomotives the ones you see driving all around here uh, in in, right. uh, <clears throat> in Montana with the BNSF the majority of those are GE locomotives mm-hmm. I think what's what the most interesting trend that I saw happening in GE was this merge merging of what I'd call digital and industrial. So taking a locomotive, like a big, you know, several hundred ton locomotive, and then saying, how do I optimize the performance of that locomotive? And the business that I had the the uh, opportunity to lead uh, was a business that was focused on basically selling s- uh, software to optimize how a, locom- how a railroad operates. So that means everything from you know, you'll see locomotives around Montana <clears throat> or trains around Montana where there's maybe two locos in the front, one in the middle, one in the back. That's called distributed power. Right. So one of the things we produced was technology to help those locomotives talk seamlessly, continuously to manage that Ooh. train. Because the train's a big slinky. And right. we also develop software to effectively drive the train autonomously. Right. So you take a freight train you drive it in a smarter way, you save 10% on fuel. And that was some of the most interesting development that I saw happening there. I remember working 20 years ago as a consultant with uh, CSX Railroad. Mm-hmm. And I went down to their 
their set, their place in Orlando, Florida, yeah. where they tracked every single one at that time of their 180,000 container cars. Yeah. And they could say with the last 10 moves that each one of those 20 foot or 40 foot containers had made. And that was 20 years ago. I can't uh, imagine how you know precise the <clears> technology <throat> is now in terms of managing those assets for, sure. oh, yeah. for a transportation company. And the impact's huge. You know, one of the interesting things of so this product we had that I articulated about uh, driving a, a, a train in the most fuel efficient manner. You think about the impact of that. It saves 10% on fuel versus driving, on average, versus mm -hmm. driving it manually. Mm -hmm. And when you think about railroads that are some of the largest consumers of diesel fuel in the, in the world, mm -hmm. um, this product we had out there, we had about 8,000, 9,000 units there. We were saving our customers almost a million gallons of diesel fuel every single week. That was not that's getting numbers. Burned. And that's that's, numbers. so you think about the, the ability for, for software to impact big, heavy machinery uh, in a very impactful way. It, it, it's pretty exciting. Transformational. Transformational. That's Which exactly is a good right. theme when we talk about now starting to work and becoming yeah. the president of the University of Montana. Yeah. Because share with us a little bit, like what made you kind of pursue this, like after GE? Yeah. Like what was the what was the trajectory? What was the path? So, <clears throat> I've uh, you know as the as the son of educators, you know education has always been something that uh, is in my blood. I uh, I loved teaching at West Point, uh, getting back into a, a, a public service capacity. But, uh, but if I could get back into an education uh, realm, it was always something that, that was in my plans. You know, I wanted to see how the public sector worked, private sector worked. I wanted to see how a big company ran. But I wanted to get back into, into public service. You know, that's whether it was my parents or West Point, you know, this uh, mission of West Point to build leaders of character for a lifetime of service. Sure. And, you know, I wanted to get back into it. But I think what institutions like the University of Montana – uh, do is, I would say, more vital today than ever. And that is in, in providing an accessible, affordable, high-quality education. And, and that's not just to prepare students for this you know, complex and dynamic world, um, but the research that's done here and the role that a place like the University of Montana plays in social mobility and providing opportunity for people that, that really changes the trajectory of their life sure uh, was incredibly compelling and exciting to me so I was uh, I was very very uh, intrigued and interested when I said wow what an opportunity that would be and, and incredibly humbled and honored that I was uh, that I was selected and it didn't hurt that <clears throat> your wife Chelsea was from Missoula Montana you know yeah absolutely I mean we knew we I've known and been coming to Montana for a decade and a half now, and uh, you know this is she grew up here, went to Hellgate. Her family homesteaded here in Montana five generations ago. So uh, this place is uh, is a place that means a lot to us, and uh, and I know that this university is such an integral part of sure. this place. So that the opportunity to to work at a place that is so integral to a community we care so much about. Where did you meet dream. Chelsea? We met in Oxford, actually. Yeah, I went all the way to uh, to England to meet a girl from Montana. <laughs> it's great. not a bad place to go. No, no. it's great. So, so you spent six years, basically, your your customer you know, is buying product from you. Mm -hmm. And now your customer are students, really. Kind of. I mean, I think there's we have to help provide a good education for students right um but our customer our stake i tend to think of it as stakeholders right right it's not just the students that are coming here it's the state and it's the uh it's the 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 every citizen of this state is sure the customer of our of our university and then and because they all benefit from the graduates that come out of here the university is often over the years consider itself a regional University. Mm -hmm. Do you still think of it as a regional university? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this, uh, you know, we have world class sciences at this university. And as you probably right. maybe read in the news a week or two ago, we had of the top 1% of the most influential scientists in the world in terms of <clears throat> citations, three of them uh, teach here, right? We have great arts and humanities. 
we and I think we actually have the region's best professional schools. So the education and that paired with this interdisciplinary core uh, education at the University of Montana, I think we are. I think we're a, a, a leader in terms of the, the value of education we provide in the region. I mentioned in the lead into uh, the show today that um, only 40% of Americans have college degrees, and that, mm-hmm. that ranks 19th in, in, in the world in terms of, right. uh, of educational attainment. And we're also seeing a drop-off in the number of high school graduates there are just because of falling birth rates. Mm-hmm. And many major institutions are seeing a, a decrease not only in applications, but in enrollment. I think I read somewhere 58% of universities uh, are worried about enrollment or seeing a decrease in enrollment. Here, there seems to be an appetite for growing or retaining or getting back to where we were. At one point a few years ago, I'm sure you're well aware, Montana State and the University of Montana had about the same enrollment, and now yeah. we're three or 4,000 behind them. What's your thinking about you know growth for growth's sake or growth for you know strategic region reason? How do you how do you how do you contemplate all that moving forward? Well, I think you know first things first. What we as a university need to do is make sure that we are clear and intentional about where we want to be excellent. You know where we're going to focus and how we're going to. Um, you know, separate ourselves from the crowd. I think this university has all the right ingredients to be exactly what the world needs in a university. So when you think about growth, you have to say, well, why would a why would a student come here, right? When they're thinking about, all right, I'm going to enter this complex dynamic world. I'm going to enter a world where 15 years from now, half the jobs that are going to be available to me don't yet exist today. So what type of education do I need? And I think it is one just like we offer here at the University of Montana, that has that mix of sciences, the arts and humanities, the, the professional skills with that UM core, right, that, that prepares you as the president, former president of Harvard, Drew Faust, would say, not just for that first job, but for your sixth job, your seventh job, your eighth job. And a UM education does that really well. So I think it's first making sure that you're clear about your strengths. And mm-hmm. I like to say our strength is in the and. Our strength is is in the ability to build and shape students who can be leaders, who can work across disciplines and solve complex challenges. And I think that is a real differentiator for universities today. Um, and so we need to do a little bit better job talking about that. Uh, well, well, you mentioned already in some of your other uh, you know, public proclamations about a brand for the University of Montana. Mm-hmm. And I know from my experience here that a few years ago they went through a branding yeah. experience and they came up with Thrive, yeah. you know, as the, uh, you know, sort of the, the brand the theme. Lo- theme. So right. <clears throat> what didn't that get and capture that you want to capture moving forward? Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I think this is just, you can call it branding, you can call it marketing. I, I tell it making, I call it making sure that perceptions align with reality as mm-hmm. best as possible. Because when you look at, when you spend time here and you look at the reality of the education that we provide, but you look at the reality of the talent of the professors that work here, the, the engagement, the excitement of the students, that's a place you want to be. I think the perception outside of here maybe doesn't always align with that so what we need to do a little bit better job is making sure that we're we're telling some of the stories that we're that we're that i see every day here that we're making sure that perception aligns with reality uh so people have a have a a good sense of the value that they can get coming here it's interesting because i think also the community you you say out of here meaning i'm not sure if you're saying yeah. out of missoula but in Missoula themselves, I mean, they're they're they have high expectations for the university, mm-hmm. and I think that um, there's a great opportunity to almost do a reset and to reestablish, reestablish kind of what the reality and the perception are, mm-hmm. right? And what are you doing to, to kind of work toward that? Right. Well, I, I think one of the things that's so great about this university is the passion of this city uh, for this place. I mean, I I tell you. I can't tell you how many uh, people I've just bumped into that just love this university. Uh, Wait till September first, and you're on the sidelines for the home, yeah, the opening right. Grizz game, and you'll yeah, you'll feel that yeah. more, more than anything else. But uh, but I I think it's just making sure that we're on our front foot. We're talking not in a bragging way, 
but in a proud way about the things that are happening here to right. see that their university is a great university because it is the quality right. of education you look at the studies the quality of education we provide here we have we've had some enrollment challenges some budget challenges the quality has remained constant and even improved right so we just i think need to need to blow the inversion out of the valley here and 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 be sure. very positive about the things that are happening here and i think that's that that builds upon itself sure well i what i always hear and you always hear this when compared to msu they say well we don't have engineering and we don't have this mm-hmm. and they almost have this this um what's the complex the short man's complex it's like we're not they're giants we're not that yeah. how do you change that because it's you know I think getting a liberal edu- liberal arts education is probably one of the best right, things we you have can more than, do. And we have more yeah. than liberal arts here. Right. No, I think I think exactly. I mean, but I think it's... Just that for, if you will. No, I, I, what I would say is, you know, we have incredible sciences here. I mean, I already cited that we have... In fact, we have three of the top scientists in the world, most influential scientists right. in the world here at, with the University of Montana. They're the only three in Montana, to be clear. So when you talk about strength of sciences, we've got really strong sciences. Sure. Our students can inter- interact with them every day. I, I could go on for probably 20 minutes about the depth of our, of our science and, and, and technology and, uh, and I'll call them STEM offerings. So we have great STEM here at the University of Montana. I think what's great about this education is the and, because we also have social great social sciences humanities arts which that is what students need today so it's not i mean there's not there right. should be no inferiority complex because i tell you this is the model that i think students need and and I just actually my presentations this week i cited a quote from a book published earlier this month by the president of microsoft in preparation for uh, the glo- or the uh, world economic forum in davos and they talk about the impact of artificial intelligence on the world and, and how the world is society going to adapt to it and they, they speak in there for a bit about the uh, impact on education I'll and tell what, you an interesting compliment from a few years ago when I was teaching at the business school mm-hmm. I had a student in the class who had it was a graduate class it was an, it was an MBA class who had gone to Harvard mm-hmm. he actually was captain of the Harvard baseball team oh cool and from he's from down in the, up the Bitterroot. He's from uh, Victor. Mm-hmm. And I asked him in class, how do our classes compare with the ones you have at Harvard? And he said, I learn more here than I've learned at Harvard. Wow. Yeah. And you can you can you can do that. And I tell you, you need the idea that you're just going to get some technical skilled based education, and that you're going to succeed on that alone for the next thirty years is is fallacy. And it's frankly dangerous to tell students that. And, I, and, and so when you think about what you need, and this is what the Microsoft president said, it's, look, in an AI-powered world, STEM's important, and we've got great STEM here, but you need social sciences, you need the humanities as computers begin to behave more like humans. Uh, we need the, that kind of holistically educated person to succeed in the world. So that's when I, mm. you know, I think about the University of Montana, I mean, it's a, it's, I like to say in a complex and dynamic world, leaders will rise. And at the University sure. of Montana, we help leaders rise. Well, look, you've only been here a month, so that's a pretty short uh, yeah. period of time. But in that one month, is there something that surprised you so far that you didn't expect? Mm-hmm. You know, I think, it, like I said, it's the passion of, of the people that are here. I mean, I think there's just so much positive energy. And again, we have our challenges, but I think the 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 passion, the excitement, that palpable um, uh, feeling of just uh, love for this place. Is, yeah, I mean, it is a little bit challenging, you know. You go to, like, for example, if you go to New York, if you're in Fordham, New right. York City, you have alumni that are passionate about Fordham. But in New York City, you got NYU and you got right. Columbia and you got Cooper Union and you got all these other right. institutions. There isn't a community identity mm-hmm. built around a school. There isn't right. a community identity built around a football team. There isn't a community identity built around whether you beat MSU you know, in the last <laughs> sure. game of the year or not. That's a, a totally different right. kind of you know, um, environment to be operating in. And, and how do you feel about being in that, that kind of a fishbowl, really? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's daunting, but it's a huge honor. I mean, I think you, you, you look at this place. We're entering our 125th year. Uh, you think about those who have come 
before me, right? Not just those in the 125 years before, but those who were here on this land, the Salish people for hundreds of years before that, right? right. We are we are one link in a very long chain. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I see it as my job to make, to be a good steward of this great institution, to honor the work of those who've come before and set us up to for those who are yet to come and to make this link in this very long chain a really strong one right to enable this chain to extend for not just hundreds but hopefully thousands of years into the future let me switch gears for a minute i'll uh-huh. get back to the military now that you're sort of been removed i mean i, I know you're still in reserve so you're yeah. not completely removed, yeah. and you may not be free to speak uh you know as, as clearly would you be you would be if you were totally removed but you were involved in Iraq. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you did if you did work in Afghanistan at all. I did not. No, you I know? did work in other theaters of what we called Operation Enduring sure. Freedom. Yeah. In, but in that part of the world, we've spent trillions of dollars. Yeah. What what what's your take on that? Somebody says to you, "What's your take on Iraq now, or your take on our our engagement in that region of the world? Are, are you know are we?" Wasting money? Should we still be there? You know, what, what's your opinion after you know serving in a leadership role? Who? How long you got? <laughs> um, you know, I know there's no Cliff Notes answer yeah, to that question. Yeah, there's really not. I mean, it, it's a, it's an interesting discussion. I, I would, I would, uh, and it's tough. You know, as as when I was there in late 2003 in, mm-hmm. in Mosul, Iraq, and and you're. Have this ambition, you know, this mission, leading the platoon of soldiers in the 101st Airborne Division, to, and it's all about democracy, you know. And, and I think that's just such an abstract word for people in that part of the world, um, in, in many parts of the world. Just, you know, what, what do we really mean? I mean, at the end of the day, people want to live in a place that's secure, where they can feel safe, and they can hope that their mm. kids have a brighter future than they did. And so as I thought about what, what I was personally trying to do in Iraq, and I think as you saw the U.S. strategy evolve in Iraq over time, it became about serving and securing the Iraqi populace and helping the, the people of Iraq define and chart their future. So I had a, a, a chance to then be back in Iraq uh, in 2008, 2009. I was working for the commanding general there and to see the U.S. ambassador worked with the Iraqi government, to, uh, the commanding general and the ambassador worked with the National Security Council and, and really trying to sort through how do we build, uh, or not build, but how do we enable uh, a, a secure, stable, pluralistic right. Iraq. And I think worked really hard at that. And, and so it's, it's, really, uh, it's really tough because I still think some of the, what I'd call underlying drivers of conflict mm. um, in terms of whether it's sectarian tensions uh, or decisions about how to allocate the mineral resources, the oil in that country among the various groups, uh, you know, they, they just they couldn't get them quite resolved. Mm-hmm. And so I think it's, uh, it's, it's really tough, but, uh, you know, my, I still have hope that, that they'll work through it. You know, I think when people would ask, uh, I'll tell a little, a little bit of a longer story here, but I had the opportunity to, to observe Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who uh, was one of, I think, a great, you know, this country's great diplomats, and he was the ambassador to Iraq mm-hmm. when I was there. And members of Congress would come and say, when's it going to be peaceful? When are we going to get this right? Uh, and he would, he would tell a story. I think this was 2008. Yeah, actually it was in 2008, because he said Iraq as a country was formed in 1921. And uh, here we are, we're kind of emerging from a civil war. Uh, we're trying to put some structures in place to, to kind of get this country back, help this country get back on its feet and govern itself. And he said, uh, so we're, we're 87 years after its formation. And, and I said, I am uh, reminded of a, of a speech that a leader of a country gave four score and seven years after its founding, mm-hmm. uh, obviously referring mm. to the Gettysburg Address and saying, you know, that this this is a long this is a long journey. Uh, the U.S. has invested an incredible amount of money there, uh, and sadly, more than just treasure, it's been a lot of blood uh, on both sides. And so it's mm-hmm. really it's really sad on the one hand, but I you know I think we are still uh, I'm an eternal optimist, so I I, my, mm-hmm. I, have, I hold out hope that that 
the Iraqi uh, the Iraqi people will find a way to a secure, stable, and pluralistic uh, country moving forward. You know, and as you didn't have much experience in Afghanistan. Afghanistan isn't quite as far along, and obviously, it's right. at the top of the agenda now because of the explosion just recently. And right, you know, sure. you know, more, and we've spent a trillion dollars there, and I think we we took care of Al Qaeda a few years ago there, but we're still, you know. I don't want to say mucking around, but we're still there spending a lot of money. People are still dying. And, and it's, you know, from your experience, I think I can sort of paraphrase, this is a very complex set of circumstances to deal mm-hmm. with in trying to, you know, democratize in a fashion that's acceptable to the local populace. Mm-hmm. You know, a hundred percent. Yeah. I right. mean, it's, it's, it's very difficult. I want to switch gears for a second. You, in our remaining minutes, let's go from Afghanistan and Iraq to Montana. So mm-hmm. now you've been here for a month or so. Yep. What's, uh, what's excites you, what excites you about living in Missoula and about being in Montana and raising your family here? Yeah. Well, I just, we just love this community. I mean, being, uh, and having the chance to, to, be here to, to live in uh, right near the university to have just this vibrancy of, of mm-hmm. both young people, but people of all ages that are just talking about ideas, learning about like, that exchange of ideas is, is such a fun thing to be around. And then to experience, to have that with the culture of the city of uh, Missoula right beside us. I More mean, music from, than you would ever expect in a place what, like this. I tell you unbelievable. Do you like music? I love music. I'm excited. I think Nathaniel Radcliffe and the uh, Night Sweat sold out too quickly for me to get tickets. <laughs> but I, I don't think you'll have a problem with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that but, Do you, uh, what are your activities? Do you bike? Do you, yeah, uh, no, I love to exercise. I love to I love to bike. I love to hike. I, I, ski? I like to ski. I haven't skied. As much as I like, my wife's a great skier, um, but she uh, and we're getting the kids up a little bit. But my my biggest, my tightest commodity right now is time to yeah, get out man. and do those things. So so I hope to get on a on a pattern where I can actually uh, enjoy the the beauties of Montana aside from the wonderful people here at the university, which is great in and of itself. Last question for yep. you: If a year from now you've accomplished what you set out to do right now. Mm-hmm. What would we see? What would we notice? What would stand out? Yeah, I think you 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 hopefully see a university that is clear about where we want to where we want to focus, who we want to be, that we have a a plan that you know maybe isn't isn't perfectly formulated, but we 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 know how we're going to get there and that we're working toward it. That we have. Uh, a student body that feels engaged, they feel supported. Uh, that we have uh, faculty that are that are feeling that uh, that you know they have their work supported. They're able to achieve and, and do their best work. Uh, staff and employees that uh, that are starting to feel like, hey, we know what we're about. We know where we're headed. Yes, it does. It's not easy, but we uh, we're we're we've got a course and we're on that course. And that that's what I think we. Uh, we, I really want to help lead this university to over the next year. Can we come back then and talk to you about it? Yeah, absolutely. Good. I'd love to. I love that. Good. Okay. Thank you. This is Thank, you. Right. Thank you, guys. It's great Thank to you. chat with you. Taking the time in this early part of you. Today. Yeah, no, it's great to chat yeah. with you guys. Yep, All it's right. great. Okay, we are back with What Do You Know, proudly supported and sponsored by Engel and Volker's Luxury Real Estate and our good friend Don Maddox. Great conversation, huh? You know, we learned about the man and the mission. Right. And obviously, it's very important to the future of our community, uh, his ability to bring a team together to carry out, you know, the vision for the, uh, for the university. I agree. Nothing could be more important. It's the, what, it's the biggest employer in town, right? Or the second biggest employer? I think the biggest no, employer. the biggest employer in Biggest town. revenue generator, you know, b- between athletics and, uh, you know, 12,000 students and faculty and... You know, it's a big revenue generator. He's got a you know 193 million dollar a year budget that they spend mostly uh, you know in town here. Sure. And that money goes back into the uh, into the economy. It you know we are at a important and critical juncture for the university, and there's a lot of responsibility on, on Seth's shoulders, and he seems to be uh, enthusiastic about uh, taking this challenge on and, and moving the university forward. Well, Arnie, I'm looking forward to seeing his progress, and I look forward to having him back on the show. I'll see you next Sunday. Next week. Take care.
Thank you for listening to What Do You Know? I can't wait for the next show, Scott. I'm excited too, Arnie. If you'd like to suggest a guest, send me an email at scottrichman at townsquaremedia.com. We'll see you next week. And thanks for listening to News Talk KGVO, 